Hello, 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 my friends, and welcome to another episode of Terror Radio Podcast. If this is your first time joining me, then welcome. This is a podcast dedicated in bringing you the best of horror and thriller, old time radio broadcasts, as well as original stories. I'm your host, Keith, aka the radio show nerd, still fighting off a cold as well as allergies. Wonderful. (laughs) Tonight's episode is called Things Don't Always Go As Planned. I'll let you decipher what that means, (laughs) especially after hearing these two stories tonight. So, without further ado, this is Terra Radio. The two radio series highlighted tonight are The Creaking Door and Beyond Midnight. Our first radio play is entitled Yesterday You Died and it was broadcasted on August 31st, 1964 on The Creaking Door. Following that is the radio play The Sheriff's Wife and it was broadcasted sometime in 1969 on Beyond Midnight. Now, You all know the drill. Sit back, turn down the lights, and listen to Yesterday You Died, followed by The Sheriff's Wife. Manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Silver King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. My number 
I've been up before. I'm still standing. <laughs> I take a lot of killing. That other time I was ready to go, a pair of murderers got their wires crossed. I was in the Black Arrow Cafe, working up the courage to telephone. Busy signal when I looked for a little cheer from Stella. It was then a pair of murderers got their wires crossed. Stella, listen to me. I'm sick, a mental invalid, capable of any violence against you. He'll never free you, he'll never let go, Mr. My way is your only escape. But murder, the honest is, he's murdering you every minute, every day. Yes, yes, I die. Just needed my corpse to say yes. Yeah. Well, 
coffee? Uh, tell her. Yes? How are the finances? Say existing. Who's the good fairy? Say what you want to say, Steve. The last job I left was three months ago. Oh. But we're eating. The landlord's not threatening. And uh, you wore a new dress last night. I'll have that coffee now. Thanks. Oh, and my insurance is all paid up. Surprise, no arrears. Yeah, <laughs> coffee's ice cold. Well, what's the answer, Stella? I've, I've borrowed. From whom? Carl Stanley. Why does Carl care? He's your friend. Making secret loans of money to my wife. I wanted the loans. Secret. Why? To, to save your pride. You resent people you're obligated to. Even friends. Not try again, Stella. Why? What is secret? To avoid this. this Inquisition. Your brooding mistrust of a simple act of kindness. The search for hidden murders where there aren't any. <laughs> to avoid this insulting death degree. My friend Carl and Stella's lover. I knew the other man now. I went to thank Carl for favors received. Doctor Carl. And a cat. Nice surprise to see you. You were dropping in like this. I had a dream about your a dream. Uh, that you were a cat and that you'd swallowed me. <laughs> You're not laughing? No. I never laugh at. Uh... Symptoms. Oh, but you are laughing behind that cat's smile. There's a laugh going. Steve, you're in a bad way. I didn't come here for a consultation, Doctor. You came to attack me? Why? For being careless about money. So you know about the loans? I found out about them. You've been keeping me alive for months. You're my friend. So you own me and Stella. We're in pawn to you. You've always put things badly, Steve. And what's the analysis for that? Since you ask, insecurity. You can't accept kindnesses for what they are. Your anxieties into Now, I also owe you a fee. I'm not your physician, Steve. Nor could I be. I'm your friend. My wife's friend. Your friend. We were together once and it was good. Steve, Steve, let's go back to those days. Where... Where were we before, Carl? Mountain climbing. A log fire and a pipe full of talk before we turned in. Ah, remember Devil's Peak. Oh, what a climb. Let's go back to it, Steve. You still own that mountain cabin? Just as we left it. And the season is officially open. Let's go back to it, Steve. All right. Let's go back to it, Carl. <laughs> open season, officially, for hunting deer, and unofficially, for murder. Mm. <laughs> An accidental fall with a push from behind to help, then 4,000 feet to smash against the boulder. Or an accidental rifle bullet intended for a deer. <laughs> I didn't wear my hat. I hung it up over there on the branch of that tree. A bullseye, Carl. It would have torn my head off. How did you come to hang your hat on the branch? How did you come to shoot? There was a movement in the bush and then a shadow dropping a spanner. A deer, I thought. Steve. Steve, what is this? Come out in the open. If I had, I'd be dead. Steve. You dare! You dare! 
United Airlines, I want to reserve a flight ticket to Glasgow. Tonight's plane. It's got to be seven tonight. I've got urgent business. Ah, good. Steve Barrett, 27 Sand Street, Kensington. Flight 11. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Um, how long to Glasgow? Uh, the plane lands at 10 p.m. Good. Uh, thanks again. Ticket office, another airport, a competing airline, the Bristow Airline. But I wasn't Steve Barrett at this airport ticket office. A prop moustache, face puffed out with wads of cotton stuck between my gums and cheeks, wax pencil lines, raised the face and changes. <laughs> Old amateur theatrical paying off. Yes, sir. Uh, a ticket for Glasgow, please, for the 8 p.m. flight to tonight. Uh, one moment, please. Oh, yes, sir. It's available. Flight 76. Your name is it? Sam, Sam Talbot. I live at Guildford in Surrey. What time do we land? The plane lands at 11 p.m. on jet. Stop at number three was the Black Arrow Cafe to talk a man into hiring out for the job. All right. I'll do it. I'll give me that scheme again. Uh, you'll get on a United Airlines plane for Glasgow tonight, promptly at 7. You are me, Steve Barrett. On the plane, you mind your own business, attract no more attention than necessary. Go to sleep with a newspaper on your face. What do I do? On a landing at 10 p.m., you telephone this telegram to my wife. Tell her, just arrived, bad go, concerning newspaper job. Yes, sir. 
and so on and so on. Turn it in front, please, close to 10 p.m. as you can. And then lose yourself, take a train somewhere. And then. And then. What? When you've murdered your wife and you're in the clear with a perfect alibi, what's my cut of the insurance? <laughs> oh, quit rolling your eyes, Governor. Your scheme isn't hard to work out, Jenna. Oh, I... I'd forgotten that Stella, too, was in trouble. Oh, yes, I'm sure you forgot. I'd forgotten that Stella, too. What's the matter? You and a day. <clears throat> you know your instructions. Oh, yeah, I know something else, too. Something else? This perfect murder's been a long time etching with you. That's why you made inquiries about me. Well, of course. You've been weeks trying to find a spit blue like me. All right, Governor. I'm your boy now. But you're my boy, too. So long, Governor. I'll be reading about you in the newspapers. Had the perfect murder for Stella's insurance been a long time hatching with him? Had McCabe, a perfect stranger, reached deeper into my mind than I had and... Stella and Carl had crossed wires only one week ago. My motive to kill, my reason for revenge was only one week old. I was in Carl's apartment at 6 p.m. sharp waiting for him. We shared rooms once before my marriage to Stella. I knew Carl had it. Home at 6 to shave before dinner out and his evening consultation. that I'm not using a rifle. You're here to murder me? No, I'm going to murder Stella. Through you, Steve. Get hold of your... No consultation, Doctor. I owe you too much already. Don't just as I say. As you say, Steve. These trinkets. Hmm. A lipstick, initial cigarette case, face handkerchief, uh, mementos left by Stella in her rendezvous here with you. Scatter them about the room, Carl. Oh, one in a dressing table drawer. One carelessly here, one there. Steve, you're mistaken. Believe me. Gather them, Carl. Hmm. Good. Now there on the table. Ah, the pencil and paper. Your personal stationery. Now write as I dictate and write in a scrawl, Carl. No penmanship. Ready now? Ready. Stella Barrett shot me. We quarrel. I wanted to end our affair. That's all, Carl. Drop your pencil. <laughs> Stella shot you and left. But you weren't dead or not at once. A breath of life was left. Just enough to name your murderer. Steve, Steve, I swear it. There was nothing between your wife and me. Only concern for you. Concern enough to plot to murder me. Steve, it's only in your mind. Some morbid idea that but you... I overheard. You... You overheard? Your telephone talk with Stella a week ago. Mm. <laughs> you got your wires crossed, Carl. <laughs> I was on that line calling home. I dialed home and heard myself sentenced to death. Steve, there never was such a telephone call. The night you met Stella at the Café Creole... Mm, you've forgotten, Carl. I've never been in a Cathy Creole, not once in my life. It, it's just something you've invented. you just put it out of the ether. It, it won't work, Carl. You, you can't mix me up. Steve. Steve. Listen to reason. Try. I'm trying to hang on to what I know. It, it's a minute after six, Carl. I'm here murdering you, but at the moment I'm in a plane 10,000 feet in the air flying to Glasgow. That's what I know. All I want to know. <laughs> You'll have Stella all to yourself when she's hanged your murder. No, Steve, no more! No more! <laughs> I struck Carl's arm against the floor where he'd fallen to break his wristwatch. Fix the time of his death at two minutes past six. I was on a plane to Glasgow as alias Sam Talbot of Guildford, Surrey, at 8 p.m. sharp. <laughs> Sam Talbot was a man with a moustache and a pudgy face, no resemblance to me. My crime had the finesse 
that makes murder an art of bungling. Two deaths, Carl and Stella, and a perfect alibi for the engineer. A perfect alibi so that I could live and tend their graves. A night's sleep with my name on a Glasgow hotel register, then a routine application for the newspaper job to cover my trip, and I was back in London late afternoon the next day. The city was full of the sensational arrest of Stella Bass. Raid all about it, murder, Mr. Columbus, murder, Buster, raid all about it, Stella Bass, murder, raid all about it. Stella was caught in the toils, murder and the supreme penalty. Her death was only a question of time now, only time. Made three fives 
the king size cigarette of international success. Get three five. Get the taste. This is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? The manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present The Creaking Door. Bear in mind that this creature, Burke, is on trial, charged with the most brutal murder ever committed in this county. The most brutal it has ever been my duty to present to a jury. Now, I'm not going to keep you much longer. <laughs> but, you know, whenever possible, I prefer to present my cases. The perspiring prosecutor loosened his tie and continued his summation. His voice rose and fell like an old-fashioned Shakespearean actor. Burke's skin itched. The little courtroom, sweltering and airless in the July heat, had taken on the unreal blur of something experienced in a nightmare, or seen through the walls of an aquarium. He knew now that he would hang. <laughs> The new soak and pre-wash powder presents Beyond Midnight by Michael McKay. Just soak. Just soak in biotech. Just soak. Just soak in biotech. Just soak. Just soak in biotech. If you have wondered how to get your washing really stain-free, understand this. Biotech removes the stains and dirt washing won't. Just soak. Just soak in biotech. Stains, grass stains, tiresome collar and cup stains, ingrained dirt, soil and grime. Out they all come, and you don't stir a finger. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. Biotex with natural enzymes is the pre-wash powder with the most enzymes to give you extra pre-wash power. Absolutely no rubbing, no color loss, no fabric wear. Use it for cotton, silks, woolens, synthetics. Use it to make new again. Soaking in Biotex removes the stains and dirt, but washing won't. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. The prosecutor had presented him as a ravening beast. A local by the name of Prof Lemoyne had been appointed his lawyer, but whatever interest Prof had been able to work up was lost when his client refused to plead guilty and throw himself on the mercy of the court. Well, why not throw me in a cage of lions? Anyway, I never killed anybody. So, they got swearing weaknesses and circumstantial evidence. That poor girl was local and loved. You're an outsider and they got to hang somebody. Only chance you got is to plead for mercy, loud and strong. The offense relations emphasize that there has been no testimony by any witness who had seen the crime committed. Oh. Now, folks, do you see anything peculiar in that? The next thing, they'll expect killers to perform their monstrous deeds right on television. <laughs> Court adjourns till morning. Or until such time as that blasted air conditioner is repaired. But, Your Honor, I'm smack in the middle of my big speech. It will have greater dimension delivered in the proper climate. <laughs> <laughs> and the judge looked across at Burke with a kind of smile. Burke had seen a similar expression on the face of a tiger about to be fed. We 
Wake up, Pop. It's beer time. Off you go. Come on, move some. Thanks for your help, Pop. All the lawyers in this world. Come on, son, move. Not so much yapping. Sheriff? Yes, Davy. I got a lock at the prisoner now. You coming with me? Uh, go ahead. Oh, ain't you coming along, sir? Presently. You ain't staying locked up in here with him. Doesn't look too good, Mr. Burke. I'd better have a private talk with him, sort of prepare him for the worst, just in case. Ah, right, you're too good, Tom. You treat mad dogs as if they was human. Go have yourself a beer, Davy. Well, I'll be here. Go have a beer. I was sheriff when you were knee high to a pony. Guess I can handle whatever comes up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Call him Davy. Claims to be a direct descendant of Davy Crockett. But what's he take me for? A hungry grizzly? Well, like he said, you're a mad dog killer to him. Is that what you think, Sheriff? Nope. You may even be innocent. If you're guilty, you're not getting a fair trial. You're not getting a trial at all. You don't want to hang, do you? I, I just... Rather not. They intend for you to hang. Old B. Decker's a hanging judge. They decided on a first degree murder conviction before the trial. B. Decker's never recommended mercy yet, in court or out. Well, that's how it's been looking to me. That's how it is, Mr. Burke. They gotta have a hanging. They never pick a local boy if they could help us. I. I don't have a chance, do I? Not in the courtroom. But I'm innocent. You may be. But even if you was guilty and got a fair trial, I don't like hanging a man. You do? Part of my job. County's too poor to hire a professional. I have to spring the traps, Mr. Burke. I've been sheriff here quite a bit. And I've hanged quite a few. Old B. Decker's gonna tell me to hang you. But I ain't gonna do it. You're not? Nope. Then who is? Nobody. If I can help it. But Sheriff, what? Hold it. What's that? What? The sheriff opens the package. It contains six hacksaw blades. To what's the gag? Put them under your mattress. Huh? Go on. She gone. Worse. 
last one I sent up through the trap. His head. <clears throat> well, well, I well, can do with that detail thing. Yeah, sure. Everybody ought to be spared the details, Mr. Burke. Let the hangman do it. It's easy to say a man can get out of something if he doesn't like it, but it's never so easy once you're in it. I wanted to be sheriff, and I ended up hanging him. I wanted to quit. Do you know what stopped me from quitting? My wife. But Laura always made me go on and hang just one more, then another, and after that. You see, for every hang on that, I've got a bonus. Laura likes her spending money. Besides, if I didn't hang him, I couldn't be sure. Laura always liked being sheriff's wife. I know what it feels like to be in jail, Mr. Burke. I've been in one all my life. You paint pictures, don't you, Mr. Burke? Well, that's why I came down here. And I ran out of gas, couldn't afford to buy any. That's why I didn't have money to hire a lawyer. I'm a painter. Uh, nobody with real money was ever executed in this county, Mr. Burke. It's another thing. Some of the ones we hang are innocent. That don't make a man sleep no better. He, you really want me to try throwing my way out of here tonight? Bless me, you want to hang? I don't want to do it. Well, what chance I got after I start running? A very good chance, or I wouldn't be springing you. I don't want you to get caught and brought back, so I'd have to hang you. I got an escape route all worked out for you, Mr. Burke. You go through the swamp and stay over at my hunting lodge a day or so. Then I'll drive you to the state line in my truck. Your house? I guess the last place they look for you is at the sheriff's house. I guess that's right. I'll get these directions straight, Mr. Burke. You get off the trail at night, you're a goner. They'll get Abe's coon dogs on you and you're good as hang. Burke listened carefully to the directions. And then the sheriff wished him luck. Went out and locked the jail room door. Burke's nightmare had begun. I feel like a new man. It's a lovely day today. I thought I had flu. I took a grandpa headache powder, and I'm well better. When crows and flu are about... Grandpa headache powders are what you need. Grandpa headache powders work fast because they dissolve almost immediately. Grandpa makes all those dreadful flu symptoms disappear quickly. So, whenever you're in pain, get fast relief. Get Grandpa headache powder. Ah, Grandpa. Just soak. Just soak in biotech. Stains, grass stains, collar and cuff stains, ingrain dirt, soil and grime. Out they come and you don't stir a finger. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. Biotex with natural enzymes is the pre-wash powder with the most enzymes to give you extra pre-wash power. Absolutely no rubbing, no color loss, no fabric wear. Soaking in Biotex removes the stains and dirt that washing won't. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. Torn. 
the skin worn through to the knuckle bone. Blood ran down his arm. Four of the blades snapped before he had torn through the first bar. the last bar loose. When the bar was at last out, he was more tired than he had ever been. He was dripping a sweat and the blood had caked over his arm. He began the task of squeezing himself through the gap. of the severed bars flashed along the length of his squirming chest and belly. And then, after a hundred years, he was out and free. Outside, he got to his feet and ran. felt stronger as he ran away from the jail and into an opening sense of freedom. He had never thought of freedom before, had always taken it for granted. He didn't really think much about it now, either, except to realize how much a man will do to get freedom back. He ran south. south until he reached the bayou road that paralleled the swamp in an east and west direction. He ran through an open turnip field and went through the swamp. The sheriff's directions were constant always in his mind. It was the first time in years he had remembered he had ever been a boy scout. He found the Big Dipper and the North Star and he kept heading south. deeper into the swampland. He thought of rattlesnakes and moccasins. He thought of alligators, too, garfish and leeches. But he could do nothing about any of these. All he had to do was to keep moving. This he did, moving. Away from a hanging. And then he found the boat. the sheriff's instructions faithfully, recognizing a particularly striking lichen-covered tree growing out of the black swamp water, here a tree twisted like a letter O, there a part of the bank, which ended at the water's edge with an outcropping of three boulders, like swollen things. At last, 
He reached the basin where the black water lay, shining under the light of the moon. A board announced the way to the sheriff's lodge. A lantern. Burke followed the way the board pointed. <coughs> He looked across at the sheriff, who was dressed in a T-shirt, slacks and house slippers. Then he glanced sideways and saw the body. A woman. She'd been fat. Very fat. There was hardly anything left of what had once been the face of the sheriff's wife. Laura. A body of a woman. That was all Burke would ever know about her. A poker lay nearby on the wooden floor, and as bad as Burke felt, something inside him turned to ice. My wife. Remember what I told you about Laura? <laughs> it was then that Burke noticed the sheriff held a revolver in his right hand. He dialed with his left. Oh, oh. What is... I, I mean, I don't understand, here. Oh. You can kennel those hound dogs of yours. The killer turned up here. Be That's right. <laughs> Burke. Yeah, I was out doing some night fishing, and when I got back, he was here. Yeah. Yeah. M my wife... Laura was, was here, and uh, he, he, he got her. He killed her. Uh, I figure somebody told him how to find my place, and I figure maybe he intended to hold up here and use one of us as a hostage. When he saw Laura, I, I guess he couldn't contain himself. At this moment, Burke took a tentative step forward, but the revolver waved him back silently. No. No. You can take your time getting here. No, he won't cause no more trouble. I took care of that. I saved the county a little money. The sheriff sat, crossed his legs, and pointed the revolver halfway across the room at first. Mr. Burke, and you got me out. We're even. No, he... Well, listen, you can't, can't, I mean... They were going to hang you anyway, Mr. Burke. And this is much easier, it really is. 
I ought to know how much better it is. I mean, quick and clean this way. And like I said, I'd never hang another man. wondered how to get your washing really stain-free, understand this. Biotex removes the stains and dirt washing won't. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. Stains, grass stains, tiresome collar and cup stains, ingrain dirt, soil and grime. Out they all come and you don't stir a finger. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. Biotex with natural enzymes is the pre-wash powder with the most enzymes to give you extra pre-wash power. Absolutely no rubbing, no color loss, no fabric wear. Use it for cotton, silks, woolens, synthetics. Use it to make you again. Soaking in Biotex removes the stains and dirt, but washing won't. Just soak. Just soak in Biotex. We hope you enjoyed tonight's story. Perhaps enjoyed isn't quite the word. At least we hope you felt it absolutely necessary to find out what happened. It's a strange world we live in. That's a truism I know, often quoted, but like all truisms, difficult to withhold. Next week, something quite different. The story of Mrs. Smith. Yes, I did say Smith. Two S. It was not until the third morning of Mark's visit to the rectory that he noticed anything peculiar about Mrs. Smith, the housekeeper. She was strikingly beautiful, certainly, but there was something else, too. The happenings of that summer are still unexplained. Three summer weeks Mark decided to spend at Little Haberthatch. On the third day, the mystery of Mrs. Smith began. And the events did not reach their strange, eerie conclusion until 20 days had passed. And on that 20th day, it was long beyond midnight. Mrs. Smith, beyond midnight, a week from tonight. Beyond Midnight is presented every Friday night at half past nine by Biotech, the new soap and pre-wash powder. The program is adapted for broadcasting and produced by Michael McKay. Well, that's our show for tonight. I want to thank you all for listening. And remember, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash terror 1970 or you can find me on instagram at radio show nerd i also have a youtube channel terror radio please check it out subscribe like and share the videos it will be highly appreciated again this is your host keith better known as the radio show nerd signing off <laughs>